We are very excited about today's show, but before we begin, we've got Jesse Ledoux with our product feature of the week. Jesse, tell us what you got for us. Hey, Steven. So this weekend, I was doing the full face of makeup, lashes, everything, and I realized I was missing one key item in my makeup bag. Scandalous. What was it? I know. Shocking. <laughs> and I've been using pencil eyeliner for so long, but something about using a really crisp liquid eyeliner on top of a lash line just makes your entire makeup look like totally glam and all come together. All right. So... First off, what product are you speaking of or you can leave it suspenseful? Uh, the second question is, what's the difference really between a pencil eyeliner and a liquid? Outside the obvious, right? One's liquid and one's pencil. But like, what's the, the application difference? Sure. So the product I used to use religiously and I just like used it to death and I have since reordered because I realized how much I missed it in my life was the Taylor Sparkles liquid eyeliner. And we do have it on our shop and it's eleven ninety nine. So I'll say that and then we'll go back to the details between pencil and liquid. And so a pencil eyeliner is just that it's pretty much like a crayon that you draw on your eye, um, build coverage, et cetera. Um, but something so special about the liquid is it's often in like, well, I know this one specifically is a felt tip. So if you've ever used a Sharpie, you likely know what a felt tip is like, but they have different thicknesses. Um, this one in particular comes to a perfect point. So you can do a little bit thicker on the lid itself and then cat eye it out for a really dramatic effect. And it gives you just like the best control possible. Mm, okay. Got it. Okay, so does it last longer or does it just look more dominant on the eye? Well, I I don't want to say it lasts longer, but I I personally feel like it does because if I like do like an eye touch during the night, which I'm a face toucher, so that happens, I do feel like my liquid stays on longer because especially this Taylor Sparkles that I've been using for a while in the past, it's waterproof, smudge proof, and like... The one challenge I find with pencil eyeliner, or if I use shadow as an eyeliner, which I do now since I don't do lashes every day, but when I use a lash, which most pageant contestants are using, the pigment is so much stronger with a liquid. It comes out like as this particular one is black as can be, which you always want on your lash line to really, again, create that dramatic effect that will draw the eye to your eyes. So if you're Italian like you are or any other ethnicity that like like my wife, Brazilian, that you cannot talk without like using your hands and you touch your face and everybody else around you use liquid. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And again, also under stage lights, because you, you do sweat more under stage lights under stress. So I find the liquid, it goes on really clean and then it dries and often will not move much afterwards. That's great. So you said we have it in our shop. It's eleven ninety nine. Eleven ninety nine, free shipping, returns, all that good stuff. Shop.pageantplanet.com. Thanks, Jesse. Welcome to the Pageant Planet Podcast, where we help you succeed in pageantry. Now, here's your host, Stephen Roddy. Welcome, everyone, to another episode. Today, Jesse and myself, we're going to be discussing the four things that you wish you knew before you were competing. So, Jesse, set the stage for us. Hey, Steven. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Have you heard the phrase hindsight is 2020? Yes, I have. My wife says it all the time. All the time. So one of my greatest means of preparation when I was competing for Miss International was to ask former queens what they wished they knew before the pageant, hmm. which I thought was a really smart question. Toot my own horn there. Yep. Um, but with that, I learned so many different insights that I never would have considered. And they range from generic um, more widespread to very specific. Um, but this week we talked, um, we're going to talk on the pod about some common lessons we hear from past queens. And as always, we polled our Instagram audience to see what some of theirs were. So we'll share those. Yeah, that, I, I really do like that that question because it is so valuable. Um, another deviation that, that I do that I like to ask people that, um, you know, maybe I don't know a whole lot about their occupation or like, um, when I'm sitting in front of an expert, like I was sitting in front of a banker and he's like, oh, a lot of businesses like ask me questions or take me out to lunch to get my consulting advice. And mm. so I was like, well, like if you were sitting where I'm sitting, I don't know much about like how bankers help small businesses, like with my wife, with her medical spa. I was like, what's an important question that I should be asking you that you wish more small businesses would ask mm. you, right? 
And sure. so it caused him to think. And he's like, well, one of the most important things is X. He filled it in. So the same way when you're sitting next across from a national title holder, local title holder, somebody basically who they have a title that you want, <laughs> maybe, maybe that could be a, a, a suitable way to spin it. Well, and I'll even give a concrete example of one of the means of advice that I received. And that was, you know, I, I can be the international pageant system. We know I want us this international. And I asked several former contestants and winners. And there was a lot at the time. I think it's evolved quite a bit to be um, a different level. And we'll get into that. But it was rehearsal wear was so important. Girls were wearing like thousands of dollars worth of wardrobe for rehearsals. Wow. And it was like so much focus on it. And one of the past queens, I think almost an immediate past queen said, don't worry about your rehearsal. Look great, but you do not have to wear the level of expense that people are saying you need to, which I thought was a great piece of advice because I was stressing that because, I mean, it's one of those things you, you spend so much in your wardrobe, your preparation, your travel. It was a relief to hear her say that to me. So yeah. just an example. Yeah. The budgetary restraints the, uh, of pageants are hard, especially in for a newbie, you can really spend money in a lot of areas where it's like, no, you don't need to spend money on that. Like just, you know, focus. And that's where obviously coaching and, and talking with an expert can certainly help you. Absolutely. And if you are a current title holder or a current contestant, your homework this week. So if you have a pen or paper handy, I want you to write this down and I want you to reach out to two past queens from your system and ask them if they're willing to answer a few questions for you as you prepare. So you probably have your own questions like I did, um, but this question of what do you wish you knew now going into the pageant that you could pass on to me? So two past queens, that is your homework. Ah, love that. Okay, so we're here today to talk about the four things that you wish you knew before you're competing. So give us, go ahead and give us the first nugget of what you wish you would known before competing. The first theme is I'm calling accept the reality. And this came from Crystal Chilcott. And she said, I felt that after every pageant, if I only done this or that, maybe the outcome would be different. I wish I'd learned earlier that it isn't supposed, if it isn't supposed to happen, it won't and focus more on the process and experience more than the outcome. I think that is great advice. Gosh, it's such good life advice too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, how many times pageantry in life, it just doesn't turn out the way that you had envisioned or that you had hoped that it would turn out. And it just, that's a very mature way to, to look at it. Well, it's that famous phrase, right? It's not, life isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. Mm, yeah. Which is very true. Yeah. So anyway, what this means essentially, if we're gonna break it down into pageant speak, it's, it's like, this is something we talk about all the time and like pretty much every podcast, even it's pageanting and as, as a verb is a subjective sport and you can't predict the outcome. The results are very often unexplainable. Yeah. And you really do make drive yourself, you know, borderline crazy figuring out like why this happened or trying to yep. make some sort of sense of it. I mean, because you can go back and forth in your mind and you're laying at home at night, like trying to get some sleep and you're like, oh. Was it because I said this one particular sentence that the judge like docked my score and that's why I got first runner up or is that why I didn't make top 10? And, mm -hmm. and really, you drive yourself bats doing that. Oh, for sure. And it's it's it matters because like you have to grasp that possibility from the jump that you may not win. And while I get I will say like flaming neon sign here your mental preparation should still recognize that you have the capability to win, but it's important to make that balance and like understand that like you may not. So mental preparation is to remain positive and focused yet realistic and grounded. Yeah. So it's just kind of like in life, you, you want to believe the absolute best for every situation and mm -hmm. you want to be mentally and like in the case of business where I'm talking from is like you want to be like financially and mentally prepared that should the worst happen, you're still going to be OK. Yeah. So it's good to have that sort of straight talk with yourself like, hey, I believe I can win. Here's why X, Y, Z. And if I don't win, I'm still going to be awesome because of X, Y, Z. For sure. Yeah. It's that expect the worst, hope for the best mentality in life. You summed it up beautifully. Okay, so Excellent. how how do you actually prepare for that though? 
Yeah. So I say have a goal for yourself when you get to the pageant, because I, I had been competing by the time I got to Miss International, I was competing for 11 years, wow. which at the time was like almost that's half a, my life. That's a while. Yeah, that's, that's a good amount of time. It is a good amount of time. And the night I won my state pageant, I said to my directors, we're going to win this thing. And I put it into the air and I was so intense and my preparation was intense. And I got there and I had to create this goal. I was like, you know what? I could easily hole up in my hotel room this entire time and stay focused. So I said, you know what? I have two sister queens. They were part of like my director's club. So that I am going to make meaningful relationships with them. So that was my goal. So I would say if you are in that track of like, I got to win. This is my thing. It's going to happen. Set a goal for yourself. Maybe it's having a meaningful conversation with every single contestant. Maybe it's reaching out to three before you get there on social media. But you absolutely have to have those moments where you like, I get it, put your headphones in and be focused, but balance that with an open mind and an open heart that allows you to soak in more than the title because the odds are not in your favor in reality. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've never competed in a pageant, you know, however, I could see that it would really balance you out because sometimes if you focus on something too much, you start to Mm -hmm. freak yourself out. Totally. Like if you're like, I'm going to win, I got to win, I got to win, I got to win, I got to win. So by balancing it with, okay, you know what? I want to meet Virginia because she looked awesome in social media, California, because I'm planning on going there. So I'd like to have a friend or whatever and have, or have a meaningful conversation with Ohio about her platform, whatever. Then like it helps to balance that out as you've stated. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and for me, one of the states that my directorship had in common was New Jersey. And it was a girl named Jenna and I was in her wedding. So this like, just like that, I wouldn't have been in her wedding had I not opened that door. But if I was doing an arm workout in the morning, I, we had adjacent rooms. So I would knock on the door and say, Hey, I'm doing an arm workout. You want to join me? Mm-hmm. She said, yeah, sure. So we spent that 10 minutes together laughing, joking about how much our arms were burning. And it sounds trivial, but just sharing that with someone really made the experience more fulfilling and more pleasant. So just those things, like let your guard down at times, like her and I doing the same arm arm workout was not going to make her or I more fitting for the title. So it's recognizing that there is more to gain than a crown. Yeah. And it doesn't hurt your chances to win the crown by being nice to the other contestants. No way. (laughs) It's like, and, and honestly backstage, if you have a bunch of friends with you backstage, it's also going to calm your nerves. Because they're not your enemies. They're not, quote, mm-hmm. out to get you. And you both, you all can look out for each other, too. So if, you know, God forbid your dress rips or rhinestone flies off or something like that, you can reach out and say, help me. <laughs> like, Here's a glue gun. Like, help me get stitched up, whatever. Right? Yep. Cool. Faux show. Faux show. All right. So what's the next item, number two on our list, that you wish you would have known before competing? Yep. The next, I'm summarizing it up, summarizing it up with details make the difference. And this submission came from Taisha St. Jean. Taisha is, uh, was a VIP girl for a long time. She lives in New York. Um, just a little tidbit about her. Anyway, she says, learn what the pageant is really about through the recent title holder experience and truly understand the importance of the paperwork handed to the judges. Hmm. Like that. Okay. Yeah. So w- what does it mean? Like, Help us break it down. Yep. So I've heard many times that a contestant, um, when they're competing, there are very few instances where the contestant is truly a 10 in any category. And you may look like absolute perfection, evening gown, you may walk flawlessly, you may make perfect eye contact. However, then you turn around and the back of your gown gapes ever so slightly, just a tiny bit. And a picky judge will take off points for that every time no matter how ethereal that moment is. So it's all like the, de- what is that phrase? The devil's in the details. It is so true. Yeah. And you know, you have judges of all different types of personalities and some judges, especially if they've been in pageantry for a while, they kind of take it on themselves to be the Simon cow of, you know, pageantry mm-hmm. and, you know, they have opinions about everything and whatever. I mean, accept it for what it is because this is kind of what you sign up for. I mean, it's our industry is opinionated. You know, and so, and that's just kind of goes with the territory and knowing yeah. that like you kind of, you're able to more mentally prepare for if somebody does give you that quote nine and you also want to mitigate your risk by like, as we said in the previous comment, um, preparing, let's see, preparing for the worst 
Like if everything else goes wrong, you'll, you'll still be set, set, setting yourself up for success. Wow. Mm -hmm. twister. No, it's totally true. And it's a great segue. And I think it's important because I can guarantee you that the field of competitors in any pageant will be fierce. And I always say that. And, and when I, I've rarely been to a pageant where there's been a runaway winner. Have you? Oh, well, okay. So I have, however, I mean, it's like one of those, it's one of those pageants where it has like eight girls, um, you know, and then one girl was a former like state title holder in the USA system, you know, something like that. And the other, most of the other girls are like newbies because the pageants a start up, you know, it's like one of those things, mm -hmm. you know, so, and it's just, but it is, it's very rare, you know, but if I'm just to be authentic, I have, however, it's very rare. And, yeah. That's the exception you know, to the rule. And here's the thing. I was at a pageant where there was a girl that I just sitting in the fan. I wasn't, I wasn't judging or anything. I was sure hundred percent. I'm like, Oh my God, like, this isn't even contest, right? The girl didn't win. The girl did not win. And I was, I mean, it was like almost similar situation, right? She was like former uh, state title holder in the USA system. Everybody else was somewhat newbies. However, the judging panel decides, right? And so if the judges are like, if she, <laughs> you know, anyways, it, the judges have their opinions for whatever reason they had their opinions. But I was just like, oh, okay, well, they were looking for something else. Yep. And I, can, I think we can talk about, like, we talk about Livia Culpo probably like in 25% of our podcast, but she is as relevant because I'm sure that there were, content, like, there's probably a, a former runner up that competed against her, but yet she came in the first time, like, came in hot, proved that she could be the one. So, what we're getting at is that every single detail counts because the race is often very tight. And, like, you have to squeeze as much as you can out of every judging round to position yourself for success. So if you, so essentially if you can control points, why wouldn't you? So if you know that your dress is too short, wear shorter shoes so that you don't get points taken off for your shoe, your shoes showing. If you know what you have the control to proofread that paperwork a million times to ensure it's perfect, why wouldn't you? So those little things that you can control Control them. Yeah. Right? Yeah, completely. Control the controllables. Because mm -hmm. there's so much you can't control. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and yet so much of the things that most title holders focus on are the items they're not able to control. Completely true. Oh, so true. And, you know, so I had a mentor, gosh, it's been... I don't know, six, seven years ago. And he was in my life for a short period of time. And I noticed this, that people come into my life for short periods of time to teach me certain things. And then they leave or I leave or however you want to say that this particular gentleman, very successful. And he was just like, Stephen, if you just do the exact opposite of what everyone else does, you'll increase your likelihood of success exponentially because mm. the average person is not successful. And the longer I live, the more I look at it like, wow, okay. The average person across America does not go to the gym, doesn't exercise. Wow. Okay. If you just exercise, you'll be more successfully body wise. The average person doesn't read a book after they graduate high school. The average American doesn't read oh one book after graduating high school. So, but the average American does watch a lot of television. So if you just flip it, right, I'm not saying cut out TV altogether, but if you just read more books and watch television, you'll increase the likelihood of success. But anyways, you can take the same thing into pageantry too. Most people focus on external variables right? Mm -hmm. Rather than focusing yep. on their internal. And most of the, our pageant title holders focus on external, like how they look, their hair, their evening gown, all that, which is all very important. However, they don't, they give little or no thought to what's going on in their mind. So like their belief, do you really believe that you deserve that title? Do you believe that you can win that title? So by just flipping it and choosing, changing your focus to what the minority does, you'll receive majority um, success. I never thought about it that way. There we go. That's why Very we, unique. you and I one, two combo. I like it. Okay. Okay. So this is how you can put it into practicality. So have an army of people check your work, both paperwork and otherwise. And like, I will say this happens after you get to a point with the content. So you've already picked your gown or you've already like solidified the messaging um, so you're just having them check, like, 
the syntax and grammar, if it's paperwork, the look and fit of your wardrobe, et cetera. Um, so, and I say that because many eyes are great for catching missed errors, but it can be detrimental to you staying strong with your message and brand. So like I'm saying this, like, if you want people to look at the fit and the look of your gown, but you've already decided that this is your gown and you send it to 10 people, it does you no good for those 10 people the week before your pageant to say, oh, I don't like this about your gown or this about your gown. Direct them to say, okay, the fit, the length, the look, the hairstyle, those are things that we can change now. This is what cannot be changed. Same with your paperwork. If you feel confidently about the message you're conveying, you, you and your coach have discussed it, say, all I need you to do is look at the syntax, the grammar, the flow, the things that are controllable right now. The messaging is not your concern. And it's a difficult conversation to have when you're asking someone for help, but you need them to take themselves out of the situation of bending the message because it's so easy to get influence at that point. And to echo that, I mean, people, so many VIP girls will ask us, can you give me some tips on to win your pageant? Yeah, about 10,000. Can you be more specific, mm -hmm. please? You know, <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, narrow it down, a category, right? Um, so in a lot of times, and this is, if you are a VIP girl listening, and many of you do, right, that has asked this question, there's no judgment on you. And this is human nature. And honestly, it's just more of a lazy way to say, I just need to know how to win. So like, just let me know how to win. Rather than thinking, really critically thinking about your own self, like what are areas where I'm deficient or where are areas where I maybe don't perform as high as I would like to? And then it's like, what would make me um, perform higher? Mm -hmm. So I had somebody else in my life, speaking of mentors, he said, the quality of your life is based on the quality of questions that you ask. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And again, like the more I think about it, the more I ponder it is because it takes a certain amount of insight to really extract now knowledge out of someone who is wise and you mm -hmm. have to have your own level of wisdom, own level of self-respect, um, inflection to ask those wise questions. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't want to go down a million bunny trails with this because we already talked about our level of bunny trail, but like I got a question <laughs> yeah. today from a VIP and we love our VIPs. And if you're listening, I love you very much. Um, but she said, what's the best gown for a slender woman in a, blank competition. It was a very wide, generic term. And she sent me two beautiful gowns. And I, you know how I am, Steve. And I wrote back, I said, these are both beautiful gowns. But let's establish your brand words and your style words first, because they are all so specific to you. So all of that foundational work where you're making your important choices, the messaging, your paperwork, the wardrobe that you wear on stage has to be done. And then once you feel totally confident in it, that's when we open the door to these detail mongers where you're going to allow them to totally pick apart every aspect of where a judge could take off points. Your, their job is not to question your decision. Their job is to make you look and sound and feel perfect. And that's you know crazy. It, you get that level of detail for 29 bucks. I mean, come on. 29 bucks. They get access hair toss, to you. Hair toss. I mean, they get access to you. I, it's crazy. It's like the steal of a century. I mean, Aww. you're like just robbing pageant planet, right? That by like signing up for the, our membership portal. Oh, anyway. I feel like the Grinch. My heart just grew three sizes. <laughs> Here's an onion to eat for breakfast. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's what the Grinch eats, right? He eats onions. Yeah, he does. You're right. I yeah. forgot that little detail. Anyway, okay. So let's okay. move on to number three. <laughs> Speaking of devils in the details. All right. So yeah. So <laughs> please move on to the, the the third thing you wish you would have known before starting yeah, um, competing. Okay. I love this one. And I call this prepare for next steps. And this comes from one of my favorite people in the world, Sherry Shanley. She's Aww. our queen of marketing. Um, and she said many things. Shocking. <laughs> As a pageant mom, no one teaches you about the heartache you might feel when your daughter doesn't achieve a goal for that particular pageant. We've truly taken a valuable lesson from each experience and continue to build on our knowledge but it's tough part of it's the tough part of the game sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So break it down for us. We love us some Sherry. She's like the we sweetest. Do. Yeah. Cher Shan is what I call her. Anyway, um, so what it means for those of us that are not contestants or play a supporting role in the lives of other contestants, this suggestion is oh, those of us that 
our contestants or our supporting role, the suggestion is extremely valuable. So with that, I mean, after a pageant, you almost go through the stages of grief um, because of the personal investment you're making. And it can be tough to accept a loss and even more challenging to get over the sadness of it because you work so much and you spend so much time and energy building up for this moment. It's not you. And then you kind of have this like emptiness and I, I get it. I've been there. Yeah. And th- that's something I really, um, it, the girl that I dated, um, which pretty much got me into all this industry. She plays first runner up in Miss America and seeing her after I was like, did it great, you know, but I didn't fully understand. She mm-hmm. was from her perspective. It was like, God, I'm so close. I know. Right. So I saw the yep. grief like firsthand. I'm like, and I've, then I started to understand a little bit, but I really didn't fully wrap my head around it until, I mean, mm-hmm. years later. And I still am to some degree because I've never yep. experienced it. I've just experienced it secondhand. Yep. But I could totally see that, though, that it is the stages of grief because you put so much time and effort into like winning and then like you don't. And then you start like, did I do everything in my power? And you start mm-hmm. to have those like second yep. guesses. Yeah. Well, like the, the three most, the three earliest stages of grief that I can think of, I, I don't know if this is the right order. So I'm sorry if those listening or, or counselors are um, qualified in this arena, but I, I think three of them are like anger, denial. Um, and one of them is questioning, I think, like what, what could have happened here? Um, and those are all very, very, very common. So rejection specifically is a conversation I have so much after pageants with clients or other contestants, because it's so common in our industry, because like we talked about earlier, the odds are not in your favor when you're competing because more contestants lose than they do win in a pageant because there's only one winner. So like you may have all your stuff together and be able to like acknowledge that loss, but I guarantee there will be another contestant in your dressing room. That is a dang mess. I mean, gosh, Stephen, you've emptied a lot of pageants. Have you witnessed contestants that just cannot handle the the rejection essentially yeah. i mean i've it's seen hard. everything from just like breaking down sobs to just wrath <laughs> i mean just yeah. war zone right um and you know everybody handles rejection differently and mm-hmm. i'll say this about pageantry like when you're forced I, I had the privilege of my first business failing like really hard it was very public um like in the media newspaper like on the news whatever And what it did is it forced me to look at myself and say, like, why do I still have value? Because as a man, a lot of value that you get is because of the money that you make or the success that you've accumulated. And I'm not Mm -hmm. able to speak to all men, obviously, but just my friend circle, that's guys, one of the things that fuels us. And Kevin, I know, is very successful, your fiance. So Mm -hmm. like he, he probably gets it, too. And when you have all that stripped away and you, like in my case, literally just couldn't afford to go to, <laughs> go to Starbucks, right? Um, and I had to like realize like what's my value, what's my worth? And so when pageantry, when you set yourself up like I need this title and then all of a sudden or like I got this in the bag or I'm going to win and then you don't, it disrupts your mindset. And the more I learn about people that acquire like what we call success in life, whatever success means to you, they've Mm -hmm. all failed in a way that it causes them to self-reflect and it causes them to course correct their Mm -hmm. lives. So that's why I love about pageantry is it it forces you into this. Yep. Unless you're a local and you don't have to go through it. Yeah. And those contestants that are a mess are having a difficult time, like so much so that they, Like what is Abby? So Abby Lee Miller is from Dance Moms. She's like the brutal dance coach. And she always tells these girls are like six years old, like save the tears for your pillow, which is so like (laughs) terrible to think about saying to a six year old. But like as you grow, there's something to be said for being able to control your emotions until it's an appropriate time. And backstage at a pageant may not be the most appropriate time. And those people often, again, like I have no shame in my game showing in my emotions, but I agree that there is a time and a place. But if you are not able to control that rejection, those feelings, you've not done the necessary conditioning to look at defeat in the face and rise up stronger. Again, you have every right to once you get to your room or your car, let it all out, sister, brother, whoever you are listening. (laughs) Like I get it. 
but it's up to you to help yourself or others learn and not being able to acknowledge that it's possible is a huge challenge. Oh uh, yeah. I, God bless <laughs> those of you that can just cry and let it out. Like I, I just sit there and squeeze and like no tears are accumulated. Like I, Same, I, get, we're just, oh, gosh, I know. I, I mean, I, I just, I, I'm not able to just muster up that emotion where my eyes are just waterfalls. I just, it doesn't, ha it's almost like as soon as I catch myself crying, there's something like, it's like, whoa, stop. <laughs> like, whoa, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know why. But anyways, God bless you, those that can. All right. Yep. How can you prepare for this? Like, so, how can you really prepare for that type of rejection? Yeah. So I actually really like this um, advice and I've given it to a lot of people. I've used it myself. I've seen others use it. So I know that it works. And so, so whether you are a parent like Sherry or you're a contestant, plan for what's next in your pageant journey and beyond. So it's a great idea to have something planned for after the pageant. This can be an appearance, either as your current title or your potential next title, wink, wink, or it can be something totally for leisure. So you have a trip planned or you're gonna go to your favorite restaurant that you've been like holding back for your budget or your diet or whatever that is. Have something to look forward to. And I think this is vital, whether you win or whether you learn, like that's the, PC mm, way to say lose, like right? It. When are you yeah. learn? When are you learn? Um, Good. So we spend so much time and energy focusing on the crown that decompression is key for mental health. So I, I've told the story many times, Stephen, on the podcast where I wrote letters to myself every day at Miss International and I wrote, wrote one for the morning after and all it said was on to the next great adventure. Mm. And that way it was like, okay, whether I win or whether I lose, there's something something next for me. And I knew, okay, I'm gonna go home and I have this specific specific meal at this specific restaurant that I've been dying to have. But I know other people have trips planned or events planned, but have something specific in mind whether you win or whether you don't, that you can look forward to. And I know one of our one of our VIPs now, I, I can't give too many details because she's hasn't competed yet, but she's launching a new business right after the pageant. So my goodness, can you imagine what better consolation prize if she doesn't win the title to go back and launch this whole new business that is her passion, that is her life, that's her love. So how much less pressure do you imagine she's going to have going into that pageant? Yeah. And we always perform better when there's less pressure. Mm -hmm. Always. For sure. Okay. So that was three out of the four. What mm -hmm. is the fourth thing that you wish you would have known before competing in pageants? Yes. Numero cuatro. I think that's four in Spanish. Yes, Uno, it is. Dos, mm -hmm. tres, cuatro. Yes. Ugh, awesome. Okay. I have, to, I have to count to 10 to get my numbers. I can't just like pick it out. I know Cinco and that's it. Anyway, um, okay, keep an open mind is the overall theme of number four. And this came from Ava Thompson. And she says, you have only one shot to make the judges remember you. So make it count. Don't feel like other girls or guys are better than you because they are just as nervous and thinking the same thing you are. So valuable. Like, mm -hmm. I mean- how many times, oh, no one ever really knows this, right? Because we have a tendency to downplay our strengths. Yep. And so we're looking at somebody else across the room like, oh my gosh, she's perfect, he's perfect, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're looking right back at you like, oh my gosh, love her dress. She looks amazing, <laughs> right? It's yep. like you have no way of knowing. So, okay, break us down from your perspective though. Like what does it mean? It means get rid of intimidation and insecurity. I'll say it again. Get rid of intimidation and insecurity. And social media is a highlight reel. And you never know what is going through someone else as they prepare. So for some hard examples, you know, I'm all about examples. So you see pictures, maybe their appearances are meaningless, but they always get the right photo. So you're seeing photo upon photo of them at different appearances, but maybe they're not filling their soul. Maybe they're, they're not fulfilling their platform, their plan, et cetera. Maybe they look the part, but their speaking skills are not up to snuff. So um, you're seeing all these pictures and they look absolutely fabulous. Their hair and their outfits are always amazing, but maybe they can't deliver their message strongly. Or my favorite, maybe their headshot is spectacular, but the photographer has done them too many favors <laughs> as AKA they don't look like themselves in their headshot, right? Oh yeah. So all of those things are like, such real factors when you're sizing up your competition online that you just need to like throw out the window because you never know. 
Yeah, and if you find that someone that you you follow on Instagram or yeah, basically be Instagram or Snapchat that you whenever you see this individual that you find yourself comparing yourself and you compare yourself in the negative, stop following them. Just mm-hmm. stop. Like why put yourself through that torture? <laughs> you know, especially if you're competing against them and you're putting them up on a pedestal, it's um it's not healthy. And No. So he, I've got a really good hack for this. Okay, let's hear it. Yeah. Okay. So if you find yourself um, unbalanced in the way that you see someone. So if you see someone extremely in the negative, like, oh my gosh, he's such a jerk. Or if you fall, if you're borderline idol worship, right? Like, oh my gosh, she's so perfect. I'll never beat her or whatever. You got to balance it out, right? Life seeks balance. You have male, female, east, west, north, south, positive, negative, God, devil, heaven, hell, all that, right? Life seeks balance. There's balance. So if you find yourself too, like, off balance where you are idolizing someone like I want their life they're so intelligent they're so pretty whatever create a list that counteracts it right so Mm -hmm. first write down all the things that you basically worship about this particular person and then write a list of things that you don't like right because it balances it out and then you start to bring them and the importance of that is you make them human, right? And you'll never show anyone the list, of course, because we don't want to like bash anyone, but you make them human because no one's a hundred percent flawless and no one's a hundred percent bad. So if somebody else is bad in your life, they're taking a portion of you. If every time you see them, it's causing this cringe within you and you're just like, oh, I cannot stand this person. Force yourself to make a list of all their good attributes too. And what it does is it balances it out and you're free from that person. You're free from their influence. Mm. Okay. I'm going to skip to my how to prepare section of this particular tip because it's going to echo yours, but I have a slight twist to mine. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, absolutely. And then we'll go back to why it matters. Mm -hmm. So I would say like to your point, I completely agree. Like I'm constantly seeing people that I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I had their life or I wish I had their wardrobe or, and like even as an adult, I think as a non-pageant contestant, I think about that, but Every time like you see or feel yourself getting envious of someone else, like I take notes in my phone, Steven, you know this, I like rely on my notepad, but I will make a quick note in my phone to add a positive affirmation about me. So Mm -hmm. if I'm scrolling and I see, oh my gosh, I love this person's wardrobe. I'm like, okay, what's one piece of my wardrobe that I know looks amazing? And I write that down. Or like if I think, oh my gosh, her hair is beautiful. I'm like, okay, what's, what's great about my hair? Or what's great about something physical for me? And that way, every time I see something great about someone else, I see something equally as great as me in me. And I think that is so, so, so important. And we all have been, like you said, given qualities that balance each other out in the world. So like you said, everyone has a fatal flaw. Everyone has challenges. But I would say in your preparation, like if you get insecure about something you're seeing in someone else, spent like we talked about like balancing one positive for one negative or etc but i would go a step further so if you say oh my gosh that girl has the most amazing sponsors okay write that down how can you improve your standing with sponsors can you make 10 calls this week to potential sponsors and that way okay you get five that's great now that person's strength is no longer quite as strong straight quite as strong in comparison to you. So I would say find those holes that are making you feel that level of insecure and try to build them up inside of yourself so that you can't make excuses anymore. So good. And like what you're making reference to about what you did, like if you see something in someone else then you look introspectively and say, what is it that is basically equally good in Mm -hmm. me in this area? Yep. So that's something it, it's called the reflection principle. I mean, it's like it's a type of philosophy, if you will. And it's basically you can only see in others what you possess, good or bad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, by doing that and when you find yourself in that hero worship or whatever, like just look at yourself because you could never see that in someone else if you didn't if it didn't already exist within you. Correct. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. All right. So you want to say, see, that was how to prepare. You want to talk about like why it matters? Yeah, sure. So it matters because like you can never doubt yourself in your preparation. And the minute that happens, you start to give up. And I'll say I was one of the first people in my class crowned 
So every time my pageant would post the new winner, I would, I would Google the heck out of that person. And I had a former Miss United States competing against me. I had a girl that raised, was part of raising half a million dollars for her charity. And I was starting to get so doubtful in myself. And I started to burn out in my prep. I was like, oh, I might as well give up now. This is not going to happen. And fortunately for me, I had a moment of reflection where like, no, get yourself out of this frame of mind. And I started unfollowing people because I didn't want to be on, I didn't want them to be on my radar. I had to focus on me entirely. But when you give up internally, you start working out less. You're like, what does it matter if I work out today? Like, meh, so-and-so's got this. Or I stopped being hungry and gaining connections and appearances. And I had a harder time visualizing my own victory. So the minute you make that decision to allow someone else to be more competitive than you in your mind, all of that starts to snowball. So in your preparation, you always have to be capable of winning. And that's why this point is important. And it's so real, isn't it? Like when you're going mm-hmm. through it, it is so stinking real. Yep. Like, yep. like, oh no, they've got this, you know, where your emotions start to take over and good job for you to pull yourself out of it and just say, okay, I'm going to unfollow them and stay the course. That's, you know, no wonder you won because that's, that's good. Well, Not yes, everyone can I think- do that. I will also say, I appreciate that. Thank you. But I will also say it's important that even though like you're on fault, you're taking them out of your preparation equation. When you meet them, you still have to honor their hard work and their accomplishments. I'm not saying that other contestants are unworthy or like you are better than them. It's just a matter of you focusing in on what you bring to the table because there is a difference. Because if you keep focusing on everyone else, you'll start to feel smaller and you need to feel giant on the stage. Yeah. And so one of the things I do when I actually meet someone that's making me feel intimidated or like that they have something that I don't, you know, something like that, I will compliment them on that area to their face. Totally agree. And what it does is again, it neutralizes it. And like when you start a conversation with someone and you're like, God, you know, I saw on social media where you raised a half a million dollars for your charity. That's amazing. Like, congratulations. I mean, because that is amazing and congratulations it and it has For no sure. bearing on whether or not she'll win the title. So mm-hmm. what does it matter? Right. And the judges are here and you say it. So again, what does it matter? Because I mean, it's about your internal game. And if this girl's throwing you off because you're so tripped up that she raised, you know, $500,000 for her charity, then just compliment her, neutralize it, like become friends with her, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, stuff like that has always really happened. Um, yep. helped me. Okay. So if you were to. There's four points. We went in depth, took some buddy mm-hmm. trails, all that, which is per use. How would you summarize all this for the girls listening and guys? Yeah, I think when I look back at the four points, there's one common thread within them all. And it's prepare for the aftermath in advance. So it's, did you, if you look back, were there details that you didn't keep in mind? Were you prepared for the next step, win or lose? Did you have an open mind about your experience or were you positive in your preparation? All of those things are about like, what's next? Do I have the confidence to see this through both pageant and beyond? So that's the biggest thing. Think about the regrets you could have and the feelings you may experience. And if your mentality ends when the pageant ends, you're doing yourself a disservice. Hmm. So good. Well, Thank you everyone for listening and just want to say if you received any benefit from this show or for one's previous, consider giving us a five-star review. I mean,